I'm supposed to talk about today, guys. Just kidding. <laughs> so those of you who are not veterans, um, those of you who are not veterans, just enjoy the conversation. But if you have questions, I want you to ask all of them at the end. Whatever I say, that you're like, hey, uh, uh, you mentioned this, and I'll explain it to you, and I'll break it down for you, like, so it's super understandable. Because there's probably a lot of lingo that I'm going to use since we're talking about veteran situations that um, you might get lost in the conversation, I, and I, I don't want you to. I want you to actually understand this, okay? Baseball player, I know how you guys are. Pay attention, okay? Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> the catchers especially. Focus, catcher. Yeah, so if there's anything, ask questions, okay? You a veteran? Awesome. So ask all the questions after two then, okay? All right. I'm expecting one out of you. At least one question for me, all right? Okay. Want to start? We can start. All right. First of all, um, <coughs> for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ramon Oliveira. I'm not as important as this guy. I'm the director of the Student Success Center here at our Pendleton campus, Blue Mountain Community College. And um, I just want to thank Vincent for taking this guy drove straight eight hours to get here today. Well, he had a co-pilot. Where's his co-pilot up there? Big man in the back, bodyguard. But um, you know, one thing I've learned in working with veterans is when they make a commitment, they follow through. And when he told me he could be here this day, I worried about how he was going to get here. Plane, where are you going to go? You got to go over here, here, because I'm going to drive. And then we have all this snow coming, and I'm going. He's not going to make it. I'm going to have to send my son up to get him. Nope, didn't have to do that. Everything worked out. But first off, I want to thank the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs for giving us the funding to bring events like this to you in Pendleton. We don't always get these opportunities in Eastern Oregon. They always happen in the Valley, West Side. So I want to thank Vincent and his co-pilot for coming up here and giving his encouragement, his wisdom, and some of how he got to where he's at today. So Vincent Vargas. Thank you. Um, I'll start with explaining who I am first, then we'll get into my whole story. Uh, my name is Vincent. Rocco is what people call me. Vargas. Uh, nickname is just a reference that I was a big, scary dude, like a bouncer. And it just stuck. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. My mother, I like to call her the dreamer. My father, the believer. My mother was born in a small city outside of El Paso, Texas called Cano Tio. Uh, it's a place where when people pass, uh, the family members will actually dig the hole and lower them in and cover the hole. It's so old school, it's almost like a city that's missed the time. And she was raised in poverty. She's a first generation American. Uh, she was picking fruit and in cotton when she was 10 years old. Uh, you know, she was blessed during Christmas to receive a used toy, and it's usually one toy. And so that's just to kind of understand the roots of where my mother came from. She's the dreamer. She didn't want to stay in a small town and be in the cannery like everyone else and just kind of work the same old system. She said, I have dreams <coughs> and aspirations, and I want to move to Los Angeles, California, and maybe be a model actress. At 18 years old, she left with $15, a, a brown paper bag with some toothpaste, a toothbrush, and a change of clothes. She got on the bus and made her dream to Los Angeles, California. During that time, my father was running away from an abusive father who was a drunk. And uh, they went from New York to Philadelphia to Chicago and eventually find themselves in Los Angeles, California. S soon after, my grandfather did find them, uh, but shortly after that, he uh, was sent to prison for shooting a couple people at a party when he was drunk and angry. My father didn't come home at night often because when you come home, you get beat. This is kind of the root of a lot of gangs and the root of a lot of street kids who just don't want to go home to reap the repercussions of what's waiting for them. So my father, when he got to LA, he was 14 years old, joined a gang, a Mexican gang, being a Puerto Rican is very odd, but he blended in. <laughs> him being on the streets led him to a couple gang fights, and back then it wasn't about guns, it was about chains and pipes and other things, and uh, it led him to having to join the Marines or go to prison. He, he went to the Marines, after a couple of years, he ended up meeting my mom, and the history of me eventually came. I say about the dreamer and the believer, because my father 
just believed that he could do anything with his life once he joined the military. It gave him opportunity. It gave him the family he was missing. It gave him the opportunities uh, of knowing that the harder he worked, he could achieve things. He could gain rank. He could gain opportunity for the family. My mother, as being the dreamer, she left something that was the routine of the box that she grew up in and that everyone stayed in. She said, nope, this isn't for me. i got to step outside of that box and do something different. If it wasn't for both of their belief systems, they never would have met each other. And they never would have given me the ideologies of if I put my mind to it, I can achieve it. I played baseball since I was four years old, travel ball since I was seven. To speed up my history, I went from high school baseball to college, junior college baseball. I'm dyslexic, so I was scared to take the ACTs or the SATs because I knew I'd fail those. Baseball was the dream. I wanted to be a professional baseball player with, with Roman's son. We, we played every day on the weekends. We drove, rode our bikes to the park. Our dream was to make it to the professional baseball. And if it wasn't for that, you would be a gangbanger on the streets, potentially killed from gang violence, correct? We grew up in the 90s, the most violent time of LA and gangs. If you were Hispanic, you would be a part of a Sudeño gang, which is Sudeño gangs are associated with Mexican mafia. Where we grew up, there was a gang on this street, and a gang on this street, and a gang on this street. And if you were on any of those streets and you weren't from that place, you could potentially get shot. And so how we stayed alive and how my father made sure of it was that we played sports. And so he afforded me the opportunity of learning how to lose from baseball and the incredible things I've learned from sports. I didn't take baseball very seriously because I was consumed by drinking <laughs> and everything else that comes with that. And uh, a big regret of me is didn't take my education seriously as well. I got a full ride to college in Kentucky and lost the full ride uh, to Kentucky within one year of drinking, partying, and not committing to my, my education. I actually failed ceramics, like craziest thing ever. You're like, wait, what? Ceramics? How? <laughs> um, yeah, you don't show up, you don't do the project, you fail. You don't get a 2.0, you lose your scholarship. So at that time, my life has gone through these trials and tribulations of a teenager trying to figure it out. I uh, was in a very emotionally abusive relationship. I uh, had a daughter on the way. I lost a full ride scholarship and the opportunity of being a professional baseball player, the dream that I've had since I was four years old. I was lost, I was scared, I was nervous, I was like, what's next? I found myself in a bar sitting next to a Navy, uh, a Navy guy who retired, who he used to cook with me in Texas Roadhouse making steaks. His name is Jim Daniels, I'll never forget him. And so as I'm having trouble, Jim, I'm not feeling at home here in Kentucky, I'm not feeling at home in Los Angeles, and he says, home is where you lay your hat. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> he said, Wherever you're bending down for the night, that's home. And you have to accept that. Somehow that was like one of the most profound things I've ever heard because like for so long I was, I was believed to have to find your family and be close with them. And so I was lost and I'm losing everything at home. I have a baby here. I can't afford diapers. I can't do anything. I lost my baseball scholarship. Everything that I believed in in life was gone. <clears throat> and sitting next to Jim, I said, what do you think I should do next? We look up and we see... <laughs> Whatever's going on with that guy. <laughs> I was sitting in the bar with Jim Daniels and I looked up and you could see a Marine putting an American flag over the statue of Saddam and they were pulling it down. Do you guys remember that scene? Anyone remember that? It was like CNN or something. And at the same time that's happening, I was like, oh, that's pretty crazy. I, I never see myself to do something like that. They panned left to the mother, the father, and the kids and they were all crying of how proud they were of them. They were so proud of their son, I was like, my parents have never looked at me that way. And I, and I felt bad. I was like, what am I doing in life? The past four years have been crazy. My family's like worried about me. And this kid over here, who's my age, is doing something so like memorable. It's stuck in our brains forever. The next day I went to the recruiter and joined the Army. So like in my four years of active duty, I did three combat tours. I was a special operations, 2nd 75th Ranger Regiment, and I was an infantryman. So essentially, I said, uh, I'm okay if I die. I lost baseball. I lost the dream of being a professional baseball player. I have a daughter. If you die in combat, your family receives $400,000, I believe, at the time. My daughter would think of me as a hero, and I've given her something that I probably never could afford if I tried to do baseball. And my family would be proud of me. Sign me up. That was the thought process because I really didn't believe I had anything to give outside of baseball. Like that was my life, that was, my, that was everything. My first two heartbreaks I told my wife was baseball. I gave up a home run on a big game, or I struck out during a big game. Heartbreakers, for like the worst thing could ever happen is have a bad game. And that was what I knew of life. And so losing that had me first, my first transition in life was that. 
After three combat tours and four years of active, I lost two friends on a mission I wasn't even there. Um, to understand combat, it's kind of hard. I want, I want to try and speak, speak on this for those who are not veterans, but I also don't want to scare you. Something I learned from combat is, is empathy. Um, they don't teach that in the military. They don't teach you that in the military. They teach you to do the job. My job was to kick in a door and, and, and kill or capture terrorist personnel to disrupt terrorist organizations. That's what we did. That's what I was trained to do. But they don't tell you about the residual effects of things you see in combat. I was prepared to see death in combat in the sense where either we engaged on it or it happened to us. But I wasn't prepared to, to see the... I wasn't prepared to see things that you didn't expect to see, okay? Um, there is casualties of war that are unexpected that happen. And I didn't believe that it was going to stick with me until I got out. One of my last deployments, I was working in the cache on the days off, uh, doing medical uh, evaluations and doing medical aid for anyone that was injured in combat. One of the nights, a family of seven came in that were burned. It was so odd because in combat you see blowing up, you see people get shot, you see all these little issues, and then also you see a family of seven show up and they're, they're, they're burn victims. They, they accidentally put gasoline in a kerosene lamp and it blew up while they're having dinner. These are Afghanis, uh, and there's this very um, interesting emotional response to, hey, these are Afghanistan people that we usually are the target of our operations, but now we're doing aid on the kids. And it was kind of a hard moment. We're like, this is wild, very interesting time. But the hard thing was every other day when I wasn't on mission, I was supporting uh, one more kid would pass away, and another kid would pass away. And eventually, by two weeks, that whole family died from either uh, hypothermia or infection to, a, to the burn. Very hard to hear, and I, I explain that, uh, and I know it's a little graphic, but it, it's important to my story. After getting off of active duty and thinking everything was fine, I find myself choosing drinking more often. I find myself very <clears throat> lost in what we call FOMO, fear of missing out. You feel bad that your friends are still going to combat, you're still seeking, they're still having casualties. Um, I found myself losing my identity. I didn't know who I was, because for so long the military told me what to wear, where to go, what to do. And the hard thing about that is you get out believing that everyone will respect what you've done, and they're so proud of you, but the truth is, life kind of continues without you, and you feel lost, and then you know, no one really appreciated the sacrifices you made. And the truth is, behind that is that we shouldn't really, really be thinking that. We volunteer for it for a selfless service. But inside of us, it's like, man, I feel alone now because everything I work so hard for, no one really gives a shit. And that's hard to manage. You still lose friends when you get out. And then you have to find your way and not drink. That doesn't work because drinking is what I've learned from the military is how do I cope? Cope with seeing kids that are hurt. Cope with seeing all the things they didn't expect to see in combat. Cope with losing friends <coughs> and not knowing how to fix that, fill that void. And so as years go on, I continue to drink and I continue to do whatever I can to ignore or push back or subside those emotions. I become a prison guard and that worked out for a while until it didn't. I uh, became a border patrol agent and within a couple years I find myself having more issues because I haven't fixed the, the issues that I had from combat, I've just continued to compound those with more issues. Right? It's like the downward spiral of stacking issues upon issues upon issues. Right? I find myself in the border wearing, holding an M4, having night vision goggles, wearing the same boots I had in combat. The smell is so familiar, burnt trash. And someone who's walking on the border for more than seven days smells like a heavy body odor, very similar to someone in Afghanistan. So as this dude starts to run, I start to chase him. In the, uh, S, the, the standard operating procedures in the military in combat, the the rules of engagement are, if someone is running from you from an objective, it's called a squatter, and you're allowed to engage. On the border, it's just someone who's trying to come over to get more opportunity or whatever reason they came. So I'm now stuck in a position of not knowing if I'm in Afghanistan right now and do I shoot this individual? Or am I back on the border? It smells the same, my hands feel the same, visually it's the same, my shoes are the same, there's nothing different. I luckily caught up to the person apprehended him, cuffed him up, and that's when I knew, I was like, we got a problem. One engagement the wrong way could have changed my life. And it wasn't even my fault. 
It was the fact that I've been compounding issues and issues and issues for so long that it finally blew up right in front of my face and it could have ended everything. I started going to counseling at that moment. I said, we got to go to counseling. There's something wrong with me. I went to a group session, right? I'm sitting there and there's an infantry dude, a cook, a truck driver, some other MLSs I don't even know. And uh, I'm listening to everyone tell their story and I'm like, yeah, I don't belong here. Because <laughs> it didn't feel right. It's hard to fucking do counseling if you're not ready for it, right? It's hard to do counseling if you think like, no, I'm good. These guys are more jacked up than me. I'm good. And then I had a cook say something about he wakes up at night and he checks all his doors. And I was like, I'm out because this is weird. And it was my ego not allowing me to get the help. My ego felt that my trauma was more significant than their trauma. My ego was telling me like, what I seen is more significant than what he's seen. He's a cook. That was the worst mindset ever because it alienated me from the rest of the people around me. Veterans don't have the monopoly for trauma. We just believe we do. We want to say that we've seen so much this and that, but the truth is the human race, we see things, and trauma is a spectrum. What I consider post-traumatic stress could be completely different from the person to the left or to the right of me considered as post-traumatic stress. A cook could have got post-traumatic stress by watching his friend get blown up. Doesn't mean he didn't have to be engaged with the enemy to have it. I didn't think like that. I was so egotistical, believing that no one saw the war like I saw it. I kicked the doors, I did my job. And that was slowing down my progress of healing my post traumatic stress because I wasn't really ready for it. Later on, I found a lady, her name was Tanya Glenn. You guys look her up, she's in tech, she's freaking amazing. Um, she did EMDR. EMDR is really interesting kind of counseling. And so I'm not educated enough to speak on it too much, but I'll say this. What she told me face to face was, your post-traumatic stress is not emotion, it's a chemical reaction. And I was like, what? Because for so long, the alpha male in me and the alpha units that I come from would say, you're weak if you, if, if you feel bad. You're weak if you have emotions. And you're like, no, I'm good. I almost just shot someone, innocent person, but no, I'm good. She said, fuck your feelings, I swear to God. I was like, oh shoot. That was dope. That's a doctor. <laughs> that was cool. Like, it was a way to knock down my walls, knock down my barriers, and say, I'm willing to listen to what she has. We sat down and we did three sessions of EMDR, and I finally was able to get the night of sleep I've never had in my entire life. Since combat, I've had the same dream of coming around the corner and seeing an old lady over a body looking at me with eyes. In one dream, it's, it's my fault that I killed her husband. And in another dream, she's asking for my help, and I don't know what to do. That dream hurt so bad because I felt guilty in both scenarios that I couldn't help or was it me who killed her husband. And that was so terrifying because I didn't want to see it again. It was this reoccurring dream that would go away. So like, why sleep? Screw it. I'll go drink some more. And I did this for about seven years of drinking and drinking and drinking just so I wouldn't, just so I wouldn't see this lady's face. After EMDR, I stopped having that dream. And let me explain this real quick for you veterans who are not willing to do counseling. EMDR does this. <laughs> High stress, cortisol, uh, adrenaline, and all the other chemicals in your head stop you from processing a, a, a vision, stop you from processing and allowing you to go through the brain and just do the natural healing of like remembering. What it does, it actually gets stuck in the for, frontal cortex as, and when you see it again, it's as if it's happening all over again. All the same feelings, the emotions, everything. So it's like reliving the worst day of your life over and over and over again. That feeling is, is, is crippling. It's hard to explain to you guys without getting emotional. After three sessions of EMDR, I stopped having that dream. I started having just darkness. I would still wake up sometimes and think, man, something, I did see something in my dream or something happened in my dream, I still feel it, but I'm not seeing it. And that was the first step to like, there's something here. There's something I can do to continue to help myself. If not for me, for my kids. I have four kids at the time, and I didn't get to see them because I was struggling so much, I just didn't, I chose not to. I went through a divorce and got full custody of my four kids. And this is the biggest heartbreaker. We're driving from El Paso, Texas to San Antonio, Texas, and my daughter, who's now 17, I was talking about my wrestler. I'm in the car listening to music and I'm just joking around, boom, boom, she looks at me and goes, Dad, you're funny. I had no idea you were so funny. And as a father, that breaks your heart because I spent so many years drinking and avoiding my own trauma that I didn't give my kids the truth of who I was. Because the person they saw 
was a drunk, angry, struggling, post-traumatic vet. And that's so goddamn unfair. And I didn't think like that because I, so I was so inside of myself and not allowing them to see the side of me, not allowing them to see this, this person who can't heal themselves. And it broke my heart to know that I've wasted so many years trying to heal myself through drinking and everything else that I avoided my own kids. I was done. I decided to change my life. I started to go down the path of wellness. I started to attempt everything I possibly could to make myself better for them. Because they didn't have their mother at the time, it was just me. So I started getting back into fitness. I started learning everything I could about how I could heal the trauma from my past as a kid, from how I could heal the trauma from combat. And as I started down this path, I started seeing things in my life change. Things started opening doors. Life was starting to feel good again. I wanted to live. I wanted to be there for them. And as I've gone down this journey, I've seen my brothers to the left and to the right commit suicide left and right because they are not there yet. They weren't ready or they didn't have the path that I did. They didn't have, they didn't have this child staring right in the face and giving me that inspiration and motivation to change. I'm in a place now in my life where things are going pretty damn good and I'm grateful for that. <coughs> it never would have happened if I didn't start that first path of healing. I've done EMDR, I've done group therapy, I've done talk therapy, I've done, I've done uh, stem cell treatments, I've done sweat lodge, it's a native, it's a native American uh, healing, it's absolutely incredible. I've done cold water therapy, I've done, <clears throat> the list goes on and on. I will not stop doing whatever I have to to heal some of the trauma that I've been hiding for so long because hurt people hurt people. And if you continue to hold your trauma, if you continue to hold on to it and not heal that, you will turn around and give it some other way, whether it's through alcohol, whether it's through drugs, whether it's through abuse, whether it's through anger. It will find its way out of your system, and it's never going to look pretty. <coughs> find a way to heal your trauma from the root of it, and your life will change significantly. When you have trauma and it's unhealed, you stop growing as a person. You stop growing because it'll continue to stop you, right? It'll continue to slow you down. You'll be the guy like, man, everything I do, everything I do falls right back on my face. It doesn't work. It's like, no, it's actually looking in the mirror and saying, oh, my wife's probably leaving me because I'm drinking too much. I'm drinking too much because I haven't healed trauma. And it continues and it also, it compounds on each other. It's this really crazy thing about trauma. Once you fix trauma, you can fix so many other things in your life. In, in the veteran communities and the veteran nonprofits out there always talk about, Veterans and suicide, veterans and suicide, 22 push-ups, let's do this, 22 this. And the truth of the matter is, even the Army has admitted that that system is wrong. If you're going to tell people about suicide, you're actually giving them the idea, the concept to do suicide and be part of the statistic. We never raise our kids and say, hey, you might be a statistic one day. Hey, you might be a statistic one day. I've never done that to my kids. Why do we do that with our veterans? I raise my kids and tell them the positives, the goods. You're going to be incredible. You can do anything you freaking want in this life. You've got to work hard. We somehow have done the messaging wrong in the veteran community. We do it because we think it's the right thing to do. We've been taught that, hey, let's talk about it. Let's bring awareness to veterans and suicide. We're all aware. We all know. The only way you can stop someone from going to terminal crisis, is what I like to call it, is fixing the fixing the different spaces in their life that cause crisis. Causing crisis is financial stress. Financial struggles can make you feel like you can't breathe. A bad relationship can make you feel like you can't breathe. Okay? Trauma unhealed can make you feel like you can't breathe. Pain, if you can't manage pain, oh, it makes you feel like you can't breathe. If we heal, these issues, at the root of them, we have healthier lifestyles and don't find ourselves in terminal crisis situations. It's not hard to understand that. There's an actual white paper study, if you guys wanna go look at this, and this is crazy. Suicide contagion. Suicide is contagious when spoken about. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You wanna talk about it because we wanna stop it, but we end up creating more of it because we talk about it. It's the crazy psychology behind it. It's the same as like, uh, Actors wearing Nikes, you go buy them. Actors wearing this cologne, you go buy it. It's the thing, if it's impulsive, it's in your face subconsciously, you're telling yourself, well, maybe this is for me too. 
We have to change the messaging. Everything in this room, if I leave you with anything of my story, it's change the messaging of what you put out there. Create a positive message. You can be successful. You are successful. Hard work, trust me. Feel your trauma and start moving towards a mission. Use all the skill sets we learned in the military and apply that to the civilian world. I don't care that you're a veteran. It doesn't really mean anything to me besides thank you. Outside of that is what are you doing now? We can't hold on to the identity of being a veteran but let that slow down our growth because I didn't move past it and didn't continue to grow. So we get stuck in the identity of that's who we are, that's what we should be. But I don't believe that. I said, that's what you've done. If you learned a lot of skill sets, let's apply that now to something else. And so if I could ask any of you for anything, a big ask of mine would be change the narrative. Change the messaging. It's not about veterans committing suicide. Highlight the ones who are successful and give people a beacon of light to follow. Tell the story of the successful veterans in the room who are doing things with congressmen, who are speaking in D.C. Those are people we should be highlighting. We should be giving people someone to look forward to. When you tell your kids, follow this NBA player. Follow this baseball player. Look what he does. Look at Michael Jordan. You're not telling them anything else but positives. We should do that with our veterans. I currently am an actor on a major television show named Mayans MC. I never would be in the position I am today. I'm also a writer on the show. I never would be in the position I am today if I never healed my own trauma. The hardest thing to do is be vulnerable enough to say I need help. And here's what happened. Okay? I don't only suffer from trauma from the military. In this process, I learned I'm suffering from trauma from my youth. <laughs> Things that I don't speak up publicly because it's still embarrassing that I'm working on myself. My point is, I don't care if you're a veteran, you're human. And humans are in this world living this life experience that is not conducive to success more often than is failure. You are gonna fail a lot, life is gonna be very hard, but if you have the resiliency that you can instill in yourself and you get support from your brothers and sisters to the left and right, this life is pretty damn cool. I'm living it right now, and I'm no different than anyone in this room. Uh, there's nothing special about me, I promise you. I can barely read. I can't spell the differences between there, there, and there. I've still got to Google that one. Like, I'm no different than anybody in this room. This dude laughs like, I know, bro, it's hard, okay? Mm. And you know, there's three twos as well. There's two, two, and two. <laughs> what? <laughs> These are the things that I, I'm telling you, I'm so, we're the same. We are all the same in this room. And if you look around this room, everybody's struggling with something. Whether it be schooling and grades, whether it be relationships, whether it be something even deeper. We are all the same, living on this spinning rock, trying to find a way of being happy. Okay? So you're no different than anyone to the left and the right. We're all the same. And if we think like that and we realize we're not alone, that we can heal ourselves and we can find success. My name is Vincent Vargas. Thank you very much.